not quite as young as some of the rest of these presenters, but I guess I can do the job. Uh, but thank you very much for having me here today. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, an algorithm that we're creating based upon some previous research that we've done in felt and transfer length uh, across a lot of different variations of concrete strength and, uh, and uh, different types of strand, which is becoming more and more prevalent in our industry that uh, everyone is, is specifying different different strands, different lengths, different concrete strengths, and, and that having a more accurate vision of what that development transfer length makes a big impact when you start in design for shear, especially on the end zone regions. And so we, so we were trying to use some existing information that we had to predict that. So one of the things that we did is, is uh, uh, in, in an effort to, uh, do, to uh, maximize strand, we used a 0.7 270 KSI strand in a two inch spacing on a, on a type one ashto beam, as much as we could pack in and did some full scale testing on that. But before that, we looked at doing uh, a development length test. And in this development length we uh, uh, test, we've created 50 foot, uh, 50 foot uh, eight inch by 12 inch beam, pre-stress beams with, uh, uh, we had six of them. Three of them had the 0.7 strand in it, and three of them had the 0.62330 KSI strand in it. And what we did is we pre-stressed these, and we and we put a point load as close to the end of it as we could to determine if it would fail in slip or flexure, and trying to isolate where the exact, say exact, where the uh, where the uh, measured uh, transfer uh, development length occurred. And of course, we had the different LVDTs and one thing or another that we monitored. And then as we did the specimens that we would take and we would cut off the cracked end of the beam and you use the beam as much as we possibly could, one end the other, and, and in some cases more than that. So in this, uh, in this configuration, uh, we also look back at some of the historic uh, development transfer length equations that have been historically proposed. And in it, we found a couple of things. One, which kind of makes sense that the, uh, the development transfer length should be dependent upon the diameter of the bar, right? The bigger the rebar on it, you know, in a, in a concrete, the longer the development length of transfer length. Makes sense, right? Or at least intuitively. And then strength of concrete, you know, a lot of these equations, if you'll notice, the length is directly proportional to the strength of concrete, which to me is a little bit you know, misnomer, because you would think if you had stronger concrete, your development length would be shorter because of the strength of concrete itself. But anyway, uh, this is this is some historical stuff. And then, uh, uh, but, but, but with each formula, strand with a larger strand size, the formulas got get, get larger in one thing and another. And so we wanted to, um, um, uh, and both, and the other thing we noticed too is that most formulas neglected the contribution of higher strength concrete, you know, what I was just talking about. So. We, look, we looked at these things and we came up with a table. And, uh, uh, and it was across the board as far as what the transfer length, development length should be. And so we did, when we did our test initially, I said, okay, we're gonna try to, to uh, uh, push the limits a little bit. So we took 80%, you know, that's a good, maybe aggressive, I guess. You might, consider, you know, uh, engineer would probably go 120%, but we said we were gonna go 80% on, on the thing. So, so we started at that point at that point with that. And the predictions, you know, but the predictions were across the board, you know, as much as 100 inches in some cases. And, uh, and you know, so we tested those. So here's an example of what we did. We had, uh, uh, we had uh, DMET gauges that we used to determine the strand. We determined what we figured the actual uh, uh, failure mode was for full, full, sexual, full uh, section failure. And we, with the load pointed as it was, and we staged our loading so that we could get a multi, you know, a multi-staging as we did our tests. So on this beam A specimen A70, which is 70.7 uh, inch strand, 6,000, it was a nominal of 6,000 uh, psi on the uh, on the specimen. Uh, we were looking for a micro strain of about 12,500, which would have been the yield strain for this for this particular uh, particular specimen. And uh, we varied the loads and we did the DMEC gauges. So we externally measured the strand strain on the exterior, exterior of the girders. And we found in this case, of course, that the, uh, uh, we were able to get almost 20,000 micro strain in the, uh, in the, so we definitely were well within the plastic region of this beam and yet no debonding 
on this specimen with this concrete strength at this, at this load level. And of course, we measured the vertical deflection. And in this case, the beam was long enough that we got about eight inch vertical deflection before failure. Uh, just, so we did that a number of times. Here's one with the same specimen, but if you notice, it's the E, e specimen. This, so this is the fifth, fifth time we tested this. We started out, uh, uh, you know, at that 100 inch level, and then we kept getting shorter and shorter and shorter, and we never could get aggressive enough until we got to uh, this specimen, which was the low point at about, uh, uh, the low point was there is at about 37 and a half inches is when, it's, when it slipped. And then you also got a 43 inch specimen, which this is where we actually got a flexure, uh, a flexure load. So we bonded the, uh, the, uh, uh, we bounded the, uh, the the transfer length with this kind of with this kind of testing again for this 0.7 strand and for this this concrete strength. A couple of things we noticed when we when we were, we were we observed is that when we cut the specimen and the and we cut through the concrete and cut through the strand, we noticed that the strand pulled in generally about two millimeters. So we saw and that makes sense, right? Because that strand is trying to Re, redevelop itself in the new section, and as a result, as a result, it's pulling in to you know to relieve itself of the you know to distribute that uh, pretension stress throughout the beam itself. So we saw that kind of thing happening, kind of started some ideas in our mind. So this table kind of outlines what we did. Of course, the first five tests with the 0.76 thousand. Pound, uh, nominal, nominal strength, it was 63.66. And we bounded, like I said, the, uh, 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 I actually did a 30 inch test on it and it slipped, 37 and a half slipped, 34 uh, inches uh, flexural failure. Uh, did an 8,000 PSI mix, 83.95, uh, and uh, again, bounded it between 24 and 34 inches. The uh, 0.7 strand with a 12,712 psi, we were able to, it was right at 30 inches. So 31 inches was probably the right answer with this, uh, with this mechanism as far as the, the uh, development length for the, for the beam itself with a, a full flexure at 33. Now the 0 0.62, 6,000 pound specimen, we had some transportation issues. So I'm not real confident in these numbers on this one, but I put them up there because data is what data is, and you have to explain it, uh, explain it as well. But on the 8,000, uh, we noticed that for the 0 0.62330 KSI at 8,000, we bounded it between 40 and 48 inches for a development length, and then at 12,712, uh, you know, we got a slip failure. Now, you notice I got the 46 inch twice because it was right at right at the, the cusp. I could tell when I was running the instrument, you know, running the test, I was right there and I wanted to validate that that, that happened. So it's probably just a hair longer than 46 inches when I, when I did the testing on this. So I, I plotted these things. And so there's a couple things that we, we can uh, 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 see that's going on. One, that uh, uh, the 0 0.7 strand, which is a larger strand, has a shorter development length than a 0.62 strand. And the 0.62 strand, if you compare it to what you would see in a 0.5 strand, is shorter development length than what, than what we are seeing here with 0.6 considerably. And considerably shorter than the, uh, than the ACI or the, uh, uh, or the uh, ASCO uh, requirements for making the bleed. Notice too that uh, that as we uh, uh, the lower the concrete strength, you notice that it, it, it the curve here uh, uh, cre cre requires longer development length. So it is the tests are showing that concrete strength does improve or shorten the development length in strands. Uh, and, but as it goes beyond perhaps 8,000 uh, psi, the, the, uh, it's a little bit asymptotic. In other words, there's not that much benefit to it. Some you know, things to, to remember. So we got thinking about how to develop a model to show this. 
And so we're thinking about the mechanism of, of how that strand actually works. You know, and there's been a lot of research on it. Um, and and uh, I think I want to show you this, this slide first, and I'll come back to this next one. And so we are developing a concept. You know, Hoyer back in the day basically said that perhaps mechanical interlock was part of the, or wedging effect was part of what's going on with this. And uh, in, in, this, in this mechanism. But, but what I'm thinking is, and when I saw the failure in the slip mode, the strand didn't wedge across the ridges that was created by the concrete. It slipped and twisted. So to me, the effect, even though, and, and though, the, uh, though, though, the, though the wedge is kind of is there, no question about it, but it's more, the failure is more of a frictional failure than a actual mechanical interlock failure. So we decided to make a model. So, and the also the thing that we noticed too is when you're looking at the data is that the the there was a direct direct uh, link between transfer and development link between the surface area of the strand and the. And, 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 and the, the length it was inversely proportional. In other words, the more surface area I had, the shorter the, the, shorter the, uh, the transfer and development length. So I created a model. And so let me go back to this slide here. This was a finite element model run by Vidal Lu back in, uh, you know, looking at the high capacity strand in, uh, in the end zone of a uh, pre-stress uh, pre beam. And we noticed that the distribution of stress based upon this model from strand to strand is fairly uniform, okay? So what I decided to try to make a numerical, uh, 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 a numerical uh, model out of this is I said, what if we considered an infinitesimal section of strand that was fixed at the center of the strand itself and fixed halfway between the strand and the you know, the spacing of the halfway between the spacing of the strands. And so this becomes a model where as I release my strand, the strand tries to shrink and at the same time expand, right? Uh, and the, the amount of force taken by the, or the amount of deflection taken by the strand and the concrete is different, which exacts a pressure on the strand itself and as it's trying to move radially, a friction force. Now, it could be a kinetic, kinetic friction or a static friction, depending upon whether that concrete bond is broken during release. For instance, if I release the strand, there towards the initial part, that concrete bond is broken because that strand is trying to pull itself through. And at some point in there, it, it, it doesn't break. So we, 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 we thought about this and created this model. And, and then you could ask yourself the question, you know, that strand in section will rotate, right? Because the strand is wound around the center. And so I go back to this finite element and I don't see very much validation. So I made a simplifying assumption that that, uh, that, that distance was what was reacting with the, uh, the strand itself, okay? So uh, the residual friction force restrains the longitudinal growth. So the difference between one infinitesimal section and the next is the difference that that friction has upon the, the, uh, the uh, longitudinal expansion. And so you can create a, a uh, algorithm or a process, a numerical analysis, if you read, rather, to uh, determine what this looks like. So a couple of defining variables. So we decided to try this out. And Poisson's ratio for once, you know, the, the, the ratio between the, the, uh, uh, the radial expansion versus the longitudinal expansion. Uh, it's one, uh, you know, one thing that we need to take into consideration. The diameter of the strand, the radius of the strand, since when I'm looking at a, a fixed end, you know, fixed end kind of uh, structural element there. The steel modulus in this case, uh, the, uh, the, the, the measured diameter of the wire itself. Again, I'm looking at miniature columns, you know, coming off the, each of the six strand wire. Uh, you know, I thought about looking specifically at the, um, the uh, surface area, but I decided that 
that, uh, that it probably wouldn't make that much difference in the overall picture uh, at this point in time at anyway. Concrete compression strength, uh, coefficient of friction. Now, where I'm at right now is I've just used the kinetic friction and the static friction is the same. I want to do a little bit more research looking at, you know, what that, that number actually is. I used some published data on this and a six wire strand. And with the initial pre-stretching stress of 75% and then uh, the final yield stress of 12,500 in this case. So step by step. Determine the radial expansion of the initial steel strain, okay, which is uh, uh, the uh, Poisson's ratio times the strain times the, the diameter or the radius, excuse me, of the, the initial strand. And then determine the portion of the strand, the portion of the strain transferred to the steel and to the concrete to determine my force PC on my concrete which is the force that's engaging the strand itself, creating the, creating the frictional resistance. And then determine the frictional force, you know, you know typical statics equations, really. Uh, and then longitudinal, you know, resulting longitudinal strain at that point. And then determine the, uh, uh, determining the change in the longitudinal strain and strand. And basically for the development length, you repeat this and and it gets asymptotic about it gets asymptotic when it goes down to about 50 to uh, 50 to 1 micron uh, in it and then uh, then to count out the total number of sections add them up you have development length uh, for the flexural bond length which is the other component of development length it's the reverse so if i'm pulling on that strand i'm shrinking it down now I'm looking at the tensile strength of the concrete plus the pre pre compression strength of the you know of the of the of the uh, of the pre stressed concrete element itself to determine whether it it uh, breaks or not. Okay, and then now I did use the pre tension strain without relaxation or anything like that because I figured that that if you were pulling it to the maximum maximum uh, uh, strain level then you would have to go through that zone again, no matter what the pre no matter what, what relaxation it did do. And then, so again, it's determined the tensile force. In this case, determine if the, uh, uh, the strength of the concrete is exceeded. If it's not exceeded, then uh, uh, again, it has, uh, if it's exceeded, then it's dependent on frictional forces. Going, going around there and rotating. If it is exceeded, then the strain reduction is dependent on the concrete shear strength itself. And then you can add the two together. And if you plot them, you get curves similar to this, where the uh, transfer strain uh, uh, kind of models out. This is 4.5 strain, uh, inch strand, 270 at these at that compression level. And I did it for a number of them. And then this would be the uh, uh, the flexure bond strain uh, as it develops. So I, I uh, created a predicted length for each of these, and then I compared them to the testing that we did. And if you'll see on the, uh, uh, in blue there, the actual predicted length that we did with the, the 6366 was about 44.9 on this model. Actual test results came in about 37.5 to 43. So it's in the realm of reality. Uh, uh, and then uh, the 8,000, uh, pound uh, thing is came in at uh, 39.2, 24 to 34 is what what the uh, uh, what the measured was, and then uh, the results it paid the uh, 0.62330 in that range, and uh, not so good on the 12,000. Anyway, um, this is where we're at with it, and I wanted to show you where we're at. And, and my conclusion on this was is that directionally. I think this methodology is promising because it will help us, you know, down the road, look at a lot of different variations and the different ways of approaching this and to help us better act and more accurately predict what the uh, stress levels at the end of the beam actually are when you're doing your, your shear, shear to reinforcement design. Uh, but it does need more calibration at this point in time. We're aware of that and that's what we're doing. We're eventually going to put this on an app, you know, so that they, so that the, uh, uh, the product for the designers and such, uh, once they get comfortable with it, with the methodology and such, can use that in the future. 
And uh, with that, I'll answer any questions.